Hello and welcome to the Business of Betting podcast. Today I'm joined by Matthew Davidow and Ed Miller. Guys, thank you very much for coming on. Before we get into this episode, make sure you follow us on Twitter, at BettingPod, and check out the website, businessofbetting.com. Guest suggestions are much appreciated. This podcast is proudly sponsored by Betfair Proprietary Limited. Betfair operates a betting exchange and is licensed in the Northern Territory of Australia. Residents of Australia can join Betfair by visiting betfair.com.au and support this podcast by using promo code BOBPOD. Please gamble responsibly. So thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy this episode of the Business of Betting podcast. Today I'm joined by Matthew Davidow and Ed Miller. Guys, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So in recent times, you've both shot to fame, or for Ed, you've shot to fame again in the uh, the book world with the, the logic of sports betting. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. Before we do, to be able to write a book of that caliber, which seems to be widely acclaimed in the first uh, you know, days since it's been released, Matt, do you want to just start first about a little bit about your background and what led you to this point in your life? Well, I, I started off as a poker player. That's how I originally met Ed and then uh, moved on to some sports betting. And lately we connected with a uh, modeling business that we're turning into a basically U.S. facing B2B uh, in play. We're running business called Deck Prism. And we thought a book was a good idea to both launch our business, launch the new U.S. market. There's so many people in the U.S. that, like, they've been for years, but they don't they don't really understand how to win, how to how to think about the uh, the betting the, the sports betting. Whereas there's lots of blackjack, there's lots of poker. There's very very few very few books on sports betting, and we were trying to uh, pitch in and move that in the right direction. Yeah, this is Ed. I. Uh been writing books for a long time i started writing poker books 15 years ago <laughs> and uh i really just like writing and, and i wrote my last poker book three four years ago i think and and that's when i started on the sports stuff full time and i guess at after four years i was kind of jonesing to write another book so and we thought this was the right time you know to to put something out it has an unbelievable talent to explain things in a way that anyone can understand, whether it's an ex, whether it's an expert thought or a beginner thought, everybody understands that's writing in an amazing way. And you were probably missing uh, getting kudos and doing that. <laughs> so, Ed, when you sit down to start writing a book, and Matthew's sitting next to you, what actually are you trying to achieve from the book? I'm, I'm guessing a number of things, but just broadly, like, what's the intention? So, well, with this book, I mean, it's you know, you pick kind of an audience, you get someone in mind that, you know, you want to teach something to, you know, and then uh, you just kind of lay out, you know, well, here's, here's the ideas that are kind of flowing out of me that I would, I would like to, it's, it's almost like I, I'm going to have a, if someone came up to me and said, Hey, Ed, tell me everything you know about sports betting in the next hour, go, you know, and, you know, and then I'd have to prioritize, I'd say, okay, well, let me think about what are the most important things I'd want to teach you. And so you kind of prioritize that. And then, it, and then it's just kind of out with it. You know, it's, it's really an hour cram session. That's, that's, that's kind of my approach to writing these books. We're hoping to sell some books too. Well, of course, of <laughs> course. How do, you, how do you gather all the knowledge? Because a lot of it is, for some who've been around forever, they've just picked it up in different ways and forms. Some people working in the industry, others betting full-time or a combination of different things. But... How do you find all these different concepts and test them and, and understand them and I guess even fact check and, and all that sort of thing? Is there a is there an easy way to do it in the world of sports betting where it is oftentimes mysterious and there's there's certain aspects that aren't necessarily clearly understood? Well, I've been living this stuff, you know, day in and day out for about fifteen years now. So you 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 put in the time, you learn things and you know, it's when it's all you ever do, you end up picking up a few things about it. Yeah, and and the thing is, and kind of my approach to these books is, you know, I'm going to tell you what I know, and 
it's not a guarantee that what I know is a hundred percent correct. You know, I don't, I don't really claim that. And, and it's, it's kind of like I said, where, you know, I'm going to, I, I want to spend an hour or, you know, spend a few, few, you know, chapters with you to teach you what I know. And, uh, it's just the knowledge that we've accumulated over the years, you know, the knowledge Matt's accumulated and then me for the last few years working with him closely and, and working on, you know, what we've been working on. Yeah, it certainly seemed to have struck a chord with many people who might have had thoughts and theories and ideas and couldn't necessarily put them on paper. And you obviously did a great job in, in doing that. I'm, I'm curious, were you hoping that the reader would then dig into a lot of these things themselves and in some areas that you covered in the book, you didn't necessarily give them the fish, you taught them how to fish in some respects. Is, is that fair to say? Yeah, it's definitely fair to say. I mean, I mean, I think with sports betting especially, it's very difficult to, you know, write a book that where you're just going to say, well, do this and you'll go win. Because, you know, if you say, like, let's say I go bet the Dodgers, they're you're good. Well, I mean, as soon as I say that, if it's true, which it's almost certainly not true. I mean, as soon as it's I say anything like that, that's true. Well, it, it, the market will adjust and then it, it won't make money anymore. You can't put anything like that in a book and, and expect it to be uh, successful. So that's that's kind of why we said, OK, well, we want to write a book about the logic, because I, I think kind of our approach, both Matt and me, our strength. I mean, we have strengths and weaknesses at the sports stuff. And I think, you know, one of both of our strengths is is kind of our logical approach to it. You know, we're, we're not neither of us have data science degrees. We're not PhDs. You know, neither of us, you know, have have kind of those academic credentials. But but what I think we do consistently well is we, you know, approach every situation logically. We think about the, the betting decisions logically. We think about, OK, well, if this is true, then this must also be true and this must also be true. And that and that sort of logic kind of pervades everything we do, including how we build, you know, our models that, that you know, we're turning into this in play business. And and that's really what I wanted to convey. I wanted to convey kind of our logical, how to think about this stuff logically. Matt, I'm curious from your perspective, you said, you know, more than 10 years, 15 years in the business or living and breathing this stuff. If you and Ed got together 10 years ago, do you think the book would be much different? I mean, I don't know if the book would be different, but meeting Ed and doing the modeling that, that me and Ed have, have done together the past four years uh, really transcends my entire career. So meeting Ed earlier would have been, good on many, many levels. Book-wise, I mean, I, I think that the that the book we wrote is a, I think it's an excellent book. I think it, I think that everybody from someone who has never made a sports bet themselves to the most expert, better, or trader, or sports book CEO, I think everybody could learn something from this book. I learned something from reading the, the, the finished copy, despite most of the concepts being stuff that I was well versed in and I, I it was still a reinforced it, it reinforced things I learned things I thought about things different I think this book kind of fits the whole scale talking about backward looking what about forward looking do you think this logic is sustainable or do you think there's adaptations that will apply and there'll be different layers that go on top of this how do you see it you know standing the test of time well so one of our goals in the book was to to write a book that would be just as interesting and, and true three, four or five years from now as it is today. And, you know, it's, it's interesting that actually we, we cut out uh, a lot of uh, a lot of industry type related stuff that's very true in the U.S. today that I don't think will be true even 12 to 24 months from now. We certainly tried very hard to make everything in the book a concept that is true now, was true in the past and will be true in the future. So talking about the future then, the U.S. market in a few years' time when it's highly regulated in many states, uh, the ability to get outs is something that seems relevant, and I think it applies across many of the different uh, areas you cover in the book. Obviously, you need that ability to implement any of the plans that you've you've sort of garnered from what you're, what you're talking about in the book. How important is that aspect to this in the U.S. market looking forward? I think it's going to be really important. It, when you look at a state like New Jersey – and they have, you know, more than a dozen operators now. And, and I hope there are more states that come online that, that kind of adopt that New Jersey model and say, hey, you know what, we want, we want people to come into our market. We want 
people to operate. We want innovation. We want competition. Because when you have that mindset, you know, from from the state and the regulator level, and then 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 that creates a competitive mindset among the operators, and they start saying, "Well, we need to be different. We need to differentiate. We need to grab market share." And how do we do that? And and the answer a lot of these uh, operators come to is we have to innovate on the product side. You know, we have to offer bets that the other, you know, places don't offer. And and once you get that dynamic going, and I see it really strongly in New Jersey. I mean, I see, you know, I see operators that are, you know, uh, offering action points. I see operators offering just, just you know, a, an array of different products. They, it, it's so clear that they're trying to build new products to, to, to grab market share. And, and as a better, that presents an opportunity if you can analyze those products from a logical perspective, because it's one thing to say, okay, you know, here I can bet the Giants here at, you know, minus 150, and I can bet the Dodgers there at plus 148, and there's only, you know, two cents between the two, and, you know, that's great, but it's it's so much better if there's another operator that lets you bet that Giants-Dodgers game in a completely different way that's priced differently, but where you can take the same logical idea and say, okay, here's my idea. I think, say, I mean, this is just a pure example, but let's say you're like, I think the Dodgers bullpen is really much better than the market is valuing it. And then you could say, okay, well, what does that logical idea mean for all my different betting opportunities that, that I have? Yeah, I can bet the Dodgers at minus 150, but I can go to this other site and, and maybe I can bet a prop, you know, or maybe I can bet some kind of, you know, action points, or maybe I can bet, you know, and the more options you have, the more ability you ha have to take that kind of German germinating idea, you know, that's at the base of what you want to bet on and turn that into the best possible bet for you as a better. Yeah, while I was talking, I was uh, remembering back to a, uh, a trip I made to Australia some years ago, and I just absolutely loved Aussie rules football. Every weekend I tried to go to a game, I'd watch the the, the highlight show that was on, I think it was Friday night or Saturday night, and I wanted to bet on it. But, of course, I knew absolutely nothing about it. So the one tab Australia had logged in. They had their 5% hold. I certainly knew if I was making a bet, I was losing 5% on that bet. Now, on the flip side, if I had 17 books or whatever New Jersey has now and what hopefully many other states will have, and if I had accounts that say 12 of them, and I opened 12 accounts, certainly I would be able to use a, this is a concept that we refer to in the book as synthetic hold, i.e. looking at the best price on each side of a particular bet across multiple books. And just to simplify, just think about, we're talking about a game line here to create a smaller hold. And if you do that, and then I throw my dart at Colin Wood or, or struggling <laughs> to remember some of the, some of the teams, it was so much fun then all of a sudden I'm losing 1% or half a percent, or maybe I even find a 0% holder, you know, let alone a scalper where I could theoretically bet both sides, then I can make my best guess and actually earn, you know, earn, earn, earn a buck or two. Yeah, so dig into that a little bit more, the, the synthetic hold or the synthetic theoretical hold of as close to 0% as possible or even you could potentially get a, a, a plus there. When talking through that, is that essentially just – scanning the board or scanning the options you have available and finding the best price on either alternative in a two-sided binary outcome and then pick picking the side you want and then ultimately you're betting into a in, uh, theoretical synthetic hold of, of close to zero? Well, I mean, the easiest way to look at it is, yeah, if you just open the same market across multiple books, pick the best side on the best price on each side and, you know, look and see what that hold is. Now, in the book, we actually go further than that. We show how to use related markets, derivatives, other ways of looking at the same idea, the same idea, the same, you know, team with a different line and create even even smaller holes or, you know, look for better bets in that manner. So what you guys were referencing before about growing the industry, growing the market, seeing certainly what New Jersey is doing, is that generally good for every segment from recreational bettors to semi-professionals to you know, hardcore professionals and syndicates, and then obviously the operators on the other side. Is there a way that the tide rises and a lot of the boats are, are following that, or is there a certain segment that might be disadvantaged and wouldn't want to do 
things that would benefit the market in that way? So I think most of the stakeholders uh, definitely benefit from competition. I think um, I think certainly the leagues benefit. I think the betters benefit. It's, it's sort of obvious that, that the customer benefits from competition, I think. I think what you get is it, what you, in my opinion, the big picture view is what are we looking for? We want we want a sustainable industry, right? We want the the customer to who enjoys betting and enjoys watching games and betting them throughout an entire season to basically be able to have you know a betting budget, say it's five hundred dollars, maybe a thousand dollars, whatever their betting budget is going to be for a season for a, an NBA season or MLB season, and you want that customer to in as much of the the games and as much of the betting as possible. You don't want them. You don't want to burn their money out in in two minutes because not only will they not watch the games as much after their money's gone, they might not you know come back the next year. So what you want is something sustainable where you know the enjoyment that people get from betting is is kind of more than what it ends up costing them over time. And and to me, to get a situation like that really requires competition. It requires operators pushing each other to offer the best customer experience to, you know, to, to offer the best value to, to the customers. That sustainable model, I think clearly benefits the leagues. I think clearly benefits the people that do things like, you know, it it increases the value of things like data. Uh, I think a sustainable model like that rewards people who work, who, who, who put it, use their intelligence and, and try to innovate. And, and I guess the only people I think that lose on that are the people who are paying acquisition costs. Yeah. Or big, like, you know, I mean, I, I hate to use the term rent seeking, but like, like that would be the type of person who would lose in a situation like that would be the people who say, Hey, I'm going to be better off if I can have zero competition. And, or the, you know. the first operator who has the customer, the customer's right. going to lose 500 throughout the season. It's obviously in the best interest of, all the other customers, certainly in the best interest of, uh, of the league and of the customer himself, also I'm almost for sure the government's from a tax standpoint, to have that $500 last as long as possible. Right. Who is it not in the best interest in? The first sports book he signs up at. Right. So yeah. I think a lot of the lobbying that, that we're seeing now is this conflict. If, if, if I am a sports book currently operating, having the first license, having a brand name and I've spent the acquisition cost, or I'm planning to spend the acquisition cost to get the customer who's going to, I'm going to spend $300 on the customer who's going to lose $500 in the season. I certainly don't want him to still be losing his $500 four months from now. He might find the competition by then. I want to take this $500 and move on to whether it's the next customer or the next season. And that may be unpopular, but I think that's a core conflict that we see in some of these discussions. And you look at it from a league perspective, and I, I think for the most part, everybody in this industry, I mean, more than for the most part, everyone in this industry is on the same size of the league. The more people are interested in sports, the more everybody is going to benefit. And from the league's perspectives, what they should want is the lowest cost of the customers. So the, the, the cheaper it is for the customer to gamble, the more the customer is going to watch the game. So when we, when we see the leagues pushing for things like volume taxes and and the, the such it's a little bit contradictory to that to that angle is the volume taxes will cost the cut i mean the operators are going to pass that cost along to the customers and the, the customers will, will last longer or it last less time betting into the into the sports if if if, if i'm major league baseball with a 162 game season i think i'm going to make more money in the long run by allowing the customer to bet all 162 games watch all 162 games um uh, be watching my advertising marketing for 162 games than I am to burn them out and take take his 500 recreational dollars, you know, by the end of May and lose him for the rest of the season. So I'm a trader at a bookmaker in New Jersey, the head trader of any bookmaker in New Jersey. I pick up the book. What's, uh, from your perspective anyway, what's something that they'll take out of it that they can use or what's their thought process going to be when they pick it up at... 6 p.m. on a Sunday, they finish it Sunday night, they go into the office Monday, and they have their staff meeting. Honestly, I think for most people that are, you know, a head trader of a the book, they're, they're going to already know most of the concepts that are in this book, and a lot of it will be about reinforcement and, you know, remembering things that you, you know, knew and thought about, you know, long ago, but have gotten lost. Yeah, I think, I mean, there, there are some things in there that I think will, 
again, I, I don't think, I mean, anyone who's a head trader at a sports book is going to have a knowledge base that's substantial. So <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to pretend that, but, but, you know, for instance, there's a section on parlay math that we talk about where we, we give you a little bit of a different way to think about parlays than, than I think how most people think about it. And, and I think it's a good, it might help a head trader say, you know what, actually, I don't want to let people parlay this, or you know what, I should, I should set my limits for parlays differently, or I should manage the risk a little bit differently on my parlays. You know, I think, I think that's one section that springs to my mind that I can see a head trader reading and saying, you know what, I think I'm going to do things a little bit differently having, having read that. And what about steam chasing? You mentioned that that's one area that often publicly is, I guess, similar to the parlay. You, you wrote about parlays probably differently than, than 50% of, of people out of a random group would write about in terms of steam chasing. Take us through your thoughts on that. And I guess it probably de- it comes down to how you define it. I, I think that steam chasing is just a, a basically another way to lower the synthetic hold. When you, when you look at, when you, when you look at, you know, the times in a market where you have a very low hold between two sides or even a negative hold, i.e. a scalp, one of those times is if the market's moving. If a, a group, a syndicate, or there's information that's causing some books in the market to move their line, other books could be slower for multiple reasons. And while that's happening, that's the time where you're going to have your low, your lowest hold. So it, it just makes sense. And whether it's steam chasing or... As, uh, as as Rex pointed out uh, to us, and he's a hundred percent true. Sometimes, sometimes if you have enough information, you don't even want to steam chase. You want to wait and actually play the opposite side. Once the price moves all the way through, it's certainly true that if you get the, the best price at any one time on any event, it's almost always going to be a long term winner. If you look at the price histories of, of of any market, of course, the catch is how do you how do you know when that is and when to strike. But if you think about it along, the, along those times, it's no matter which side you're, you're betting or want to bet, any time the market's moving, that's a good time for you as a better. Is that applicable for the average better though, who might be at the office all day and then gets home and sees that, uh, you know, the the Patriots went from pick 'em to to two and a half in the Super Bowl, and they get home and they're trying to bet two and a half or those type of examples? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it, it it's much more helpful. You know, steam chasing is definitely a concept, a, a time dependent concept. And it's a it's a you know, it's it's there and then it's not type of thing. So so if you were, you know, betting after work, you're unfortunately probably going to miss a lot of those opportunities. The market moves are going to happen and then you're going to just see a new steady state market. And, you know, if you're a recreational player and you have a half an hour to bet every evening. So the way you describe, you say, okay, the, you're you're better wanting to bet the Patriots. So he goes home, lines two and a half. Well, of course, from a recreational standpoint, you know, bet the Patriots, root for the Patriots. I mean, fun is the bottom line of this after all, anyway. Right. But if if you want, as a recreational player, to spend your thirty minutes in a way that's more interesting, in a way that gives you a better chance to win, don't go into it with the idea that I need to bet the Patriots. Oh, use those thirty minutes. Oh. Open your open your sports books. Open a uh, like a, a line service if you have one. Look across the markets. Look look for moving markets. Look for spots where the the hold between multiple books is smaller or negative, and then look for bets in those areas. And it could be more fun and profitable. And that's that's yeah. uh, what the book has to offer. I, I think that one thing, if I have to say one thing that I, I feel like could be reframed about the way often a lot of people talk about you know, recreational betters is I think what, what's, what's interesting to a recreational better, it, I think can be a lot more varied than a lot of people kind of talk about it as, you know, they say, okay, well, recreational betters, you know, if I'm from Boston, I want to bet on the Red Sox every day. And if I want, you know, and that's certainly one type of recreational better, but there's a lot of people that I know who, what they enjoy about betting is they, they enjoy the game part. You know, it's the same people that I play, you know, one, two poker with, you know, they, they go to play poker why are they playing poker? They like the game. They like to think about these things. They, you know, are they professionals? No, but still they like the brain stimulation. And I think sports betting can be exactly the same way where you say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to spend 30 minutes to bet on sports and I'm going to think about, you know, I'm going to try to win, you know, and I'm going to use the tricks I know to, you know, navigate this market. And yeah, I'm not going to have the same advantage as someone who 
doesn't have a job and looks at this thing 100 hours a week will have. But, you know, I, I can still use the same tools and I can still use the same techniques and treat the whole thing as, as a little bit of a game. And this is, this is I think, what, what was so appealing about daily fantasy sports, too. Because, because, you know, with daily fantasy sports, you have some people that treat it like, let me jam in all my favorite players every night. That's, I certainly see people playing it that way. But there's a whole lot more people that look at it as on, on you know, in a, in a somewhat more sophisticated way. And they, I would still call them recreational. But they understand it's a game. They're trying to win the game, and they're trying to analyze the game and, and you know, find the best players to, you know, win the tournament rather than just their favorite players. And, and I think sports betting is the same way. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think there's parallels with that. You know, not every millennial is just buying Snap stock because they use Snapchat. They're probably thinking about it a little bit differently, or certainly hopefully, um, and we can give them... Certainly the sports betters out there more credit. So I want to switch over a little bit and talk about Deck Prism and essentially how that began. What was the what was the initial impetus to go down that path and create a B2B business around in play and then modeling uh, you know, different sports? So so our concept again, Matt and I kind of got together on this stuff about four years ago. And and we started building the in play models four years ago. And 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 our core thought at that time was that um, that we didn't really see uh, the too many models that we th- we thought there was a lot of room for improvement in in play modeling and and to get basically more accurate and sharper uh, predictions for American sports and we we didn't really know how we were going to monetize it but we had this idea that if we build this it's going to have value in some way that 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 building a better prediction for American sports will have value. And that was the original concept, and and so we kind of went with this, and we we just started building models, and we started with uh, with NFL football, and we built something I think is awesome <laughs> for for NFL football. I'm really happy with what we built, and then and then we started moving on to the other sports. We built something for baseball and and basketball and some of the college sports, and and then what happened really was you know when the Supreme Court. Um, news came down, and I have to say I was actually a little bit surprised by the Supreme Court decision. I knew it was coming down, but I was surprised by how thoroughly the Supreme like it was. It was to me it was a it was it was a surprise when I got the news. <laughs> um, we kind of made a pivot. We said, you know what, this this industry is about to change in a in a really substantial way here in this country, and you know we kind of have one. We kind of have to pick our angle, what, how are we going to play this change? You know, what are we going to do? And we had these models and we said, well, I think the, our best chance is to take this, you know, stuff we've been working on for four years and, and build it into a B2B in play odds feed. So that's what we're doing. Why not just bet the models yourself and make unlimited amounts of money? Well, I mean, we, we currently, we currently sell the, uh, we currently sell the models to, uh, to, to syndicates and they they bet the market's not the, the, the market's not very big right now and that's another another spot where where we hope we're going to make a large market the way that in play american sports are currently dealt is such that it's very hard for somebody that really wants to gamble to play like i live in nevada and there's there's it's really hard for me to play to to, to play like live here if i wanted to we think our product's going to change that in a major way and allow people to play in a in a, in a way that's perceived fairness with, with no delay in, in a, in a fun way. Yeah. B- basically the, the only part of what you said, uh, that I, I, the sort of flaw in what you said is the unlimited money part. I mean, the amount of money you can make betting in play American sports right now is, is actually extremely limited on. And it's in my opinion, because, um, because kind of everybody knows that the, their predictions, you know, that their lines that they have for the in play, are vulnerable and so rightfully so they they are defensive with them and they don't want to take large bets and and so forth and as a result it's it's really hard to you know to bet them uh and and make it worthwhile so so yeah our concept is we we think we can change that we think we can uh our predictions are strong enough that operators and once operators you know use them and see how well they perform that they'll start to say you know what i can take more action on this i can 
liberalized my i don't have to be so defensive with this this is a real this is the real deal and let's you know let's let's take some bets what's the current thought process for the sports books now with respect to in play wagering generally and how do you switch their mindset from defensive to potentially one day being on the offensive so you know i can't speak to to any individual operator's thought process i'm not an operator and so forth my my sense is that they're targeting the in play products you know really towards their most recreational customers they their ideal customer to play their in play is someone who's you know going to watch the game and you know tap in a few 10 dollar bets here and there um and you know for for that customer really you know what they have is is sufficient but um, I, th- but if they want to move beyond that, then the product that as it exists now, they, they, it, it, if you want to bet, you know, even a hundred dollars, if you want to bet three figure amounts in play, um, you know, they get extremely defensive with it. They put long delays on it. They, you know, so it takes you eight seconds and then, you know, half the time they end up rejecting the bets and, and so forth. So, um, I think, uh. I basically just think there's a whole, you know, they, you know, they say in Europe, you know, in play is, is popular. It's a large percentage of the volume, you know, and in, in the U.S., it's this is not the case. In the U.S., the, the large proportion of the volume of betting is pregame. And, and actually on Twitter the other day, I saw an American operator, someone who works for an American operator say, you know, he doesn't think that's ever going to change. You know, he doesn't buy the in play story. He doesn't buy the hype. He thinks pregame is always going to be where the volume is. Um, and, you know, and I'm sure part of what's informing him of this is his knowledge of, of kind of how it works now. Um, you know, and, and he's basically saying now I, I can't ever see, you know, generating the, the same volumes that we have pregame. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but that's kind of what I read between the lines. Our, our product will increase volume by a sizable amount without sacrificing hold right that's 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 basically our promise to the operator is that is that is that you can in, increase your volume by a lot for various reasons um and and without you know getting beat so people around the world are dealing with you know loading or spinning wheels when their bets trying to be placed in play potentially and uh being you know halve the stake or even worse limited so badly during an in-play wager that it's not even worth it. Matt, you mentioned earlier about the perceived fairness aspect. Take us through what your expectations are for the U.S. market or if you were crafting a framework that, you know, that covered certainly in play, how would you prefer things be? As a, as a player, I want to know when I push the button and accept the offer that the sports book is making me that that, 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 bet, that goes through and that, that bet's final. I don't want to be faced with a delay, whether it's a whether it's a delay, you know, whether it's a blind delay or not, and I want my bet to go through immediately. I don't want to have to even think about that someone on the other end might have said, ah, you know what, he made a three there, let's not give him that bet. And it's this maybe this may be cultural, but like I feel like like my fairness is violated when when that happens and it it just me as a player causes me to not wanna not want to place bets and I could see that happening for, you know, for, for others as well. Yeah. So, so our concept that American sports have a lot of timeouts, you know, so this, this is, this is a way it's substantially different than sports in, in other places. Uh, our big sports, NFL, uh, NBA, college football, MLB, these are all sports that have large frequent breaks. And I, let's take NFL because that's sort of the flagship sport here. The breaks almost serve as a cue to go bet you know you're watching the game you're watching the game there's a lot of action happening it's there's always action happening when the game's on but you know that it's going to go to commercial break in you know five minutes ten minutes as soon as that commercial break comes on what do you do you get up you go to the bathroom you go make some nachos but it's also a cue to say well let's open my betting app and look to see if there's anything to bet on and our concept is that that's actually a very powerful concept in the u.s that that if we if we provide people an optimal experience during the breaks in the action, and this is the key to removing the delay, is there's no there's no court siding, there's no front running. The game's paused, and everyone has the same information. Therefore, you can make offers to your 
to your customers. And if your offers are strong enough, if your lines are strong enough, you know, you, you don't have to put a delay on them. You can take action. You can increase your limits and, and so forth. And what's the rest of the world knows and loves to, you know, make make fun of Americans, American sports for us. There's a bevy of these timeouts. Right. I mean, the timeouts are just constant. And, and I really strongly feel like what's going to develop here is, is a culture among American betters that timeout time is betting time. I mean, I, I think that's what's going to happen is, is, you know, the product is going to train the customer just, you know what I mean? And, and, and it's going to become this kind of closed loop where the customer gets a better experience during the timeout, they want to bet during the timeout, they get more money down, they get a better price, they get no delay, they get, you know, they don't get their bets rejected. And from a legal media standpoint, the customer doesn't change the channel. Right, and exactly. And then, and then it, it's just going to be a feedback loop. That's why I strongly feel like this is the right in-play product for American sports. But no nachos is what you're saying. That's right. They're going to... There's the, the nacho sales are going to go down as the betting volume goes up. Anti-correlation. Exactly. Yeah. I'm thinking of a uh, I'm thinking of a Baylor Texas Tech world back in the days and having a sweet in-play product to uh, have some fun with that. It's a it's a it's a nice thing to think about. So the industry generally is pretty copycat. Do you think if you get one major sports book or, or even a handful who are implementing something like this, as you described then with the way it seems to marry up to at the NFL or college football, for example, there might be that domino effect. So again, I'm not, I'm not a, an operator, you know, we're, we're starting a business here. So we're looking at this a little bit from the outside, but again, my impression is everyone in the United States market understands that in play could be something more than what it is today. So I guess my answer is yes, that, that if we demonstrate our kind of thesis about how this will play out and an operator picks us up, two or three operators pick us up and their in-play volumes do increase. Like we say, I mean, I absolutely, I think other operators are going to pay attention. How could they not, you know, they, they all kind of see that in-play volumes here can be much bigger than they are. And, you know, why wouldn't they give it a try? When I play, play I like to bet during the fourth quarter. I want to bet who's going to win the game in the last two minutes of the NBA game, for instance. So to me, I think that that's a core in-play experience, and that's a that's a spot where where I think, especially in American sports, will morph into better predictive models like the ones we offer at Dak Prescott because there'll be a lot more product when the customers want to bet most. Yeah, and that's that's ultimately when these businesses are often closing markets down or, or finishing up that match and waiting for the final score. So it seems like there's a there's an area there that needs to be covered. So I guess one final question on, on this topic. What is the hardest aspect? If you had to convince someone not to start this business today or or not to start building a lot of these in-play models, what's, what's the one area that you would focus on and caution people that is very, very challenging and difficult? The way I always put it, I, I think it requires an extremely rare skill set to do a good job on this. I think I, I think other people are trying to do this, and I think they're going to spend a lot of money and in the end not be too happy with their results. And and I think the reason is that they don't have the kind of nexus of skill set. I think there's a there's kind of a, a there's like a, a math analytical skill set. There's a logical skill set. There's a sports knowledge skill set. There's a gambling skill set. And then there's a, a technical skill set of coding, whatever you want to call it. There's kind of five five kind of important areas of expertise. Ed has four of them and I've got one. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, this is, this is, this is what I think, you know, this is what I think, this is kind of why, you know, we're just crazy enough to think that this is the right thing for us to do with our time because, because we've seen how hard it is to put all of this together in the same place. The and the game is always changing. The game always changes, you know, and, and it's just, if, if you don't have just the right kind of approach to solving the problem, you often end up with, with bad answers that, 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 you know, that someone else takes advantage of. As, as you know, I mean, if you're an operator, you're putting up a line and you're offering it to the entire world. And anyone who's got, who's got an angle on it <laughs> is going to come and beat you. you know? So you know, in, in that way, you know, we really respect how hard a problem it is you know, from that perspective, we, we know how hard a problem it is. And, and so that's kind of why, you know, 
on one hand, we're scared of that. But on the other hand, we strongly think that, you know, we're going to better be able to solve that problem than, you know, most other people. And are you focusing purely B2B? Yes, in general. However, I will say that we are planning next year to basically offer all of our predictions for for free on our website for the foreseeable future. Yeah, we we view we view basically the next uh, the six months to a year as as kind of our, our proving year, and you know we understand that we're we basically have to prove it, <laughs> and so this is this is our way of you know proving it that that we're going to put up. Uh, you know, lines. So, you know, if you're a better and you want to bet in game and you want to take a look at our numbers, you know, at least coming in August, you know, you'll probably be able to do that. And, you know, if you can win a little money doing that, then good for you. Sounds good. I think the Falcons are the Hall of Fame game this year. So might have to have a second screen open or at least check what you guys have got going on for uh, very early football. It can't come soon enough. I We will have in running... Hall of Fame game at deckprismsports.com all the way through the fourth quarter. Every time out, we will have a, a robust prediction. You'll have one user there, that's for sure, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jake. Uh, guys, thank you very much for your time. I really do appreciate it. This is a, a fascinating area. I think you know, in a couple of years' time, or at least at the end of next season, we'll have uh, plenty to chat about and uh, hopefully can do this again. Just before I let you both go, uh, Twitter handle and, and also where they can, or the best place to find the the logic of sports betting. Uh, so my handle is at Ed Miller Poker. And I'm at David L. Matthew. And uh, the book is available on Amazon. It's called The Logic of Sports Betting. So you can just search for that at Amazon and that's going to be the best way to find it. Awesome. Thank you again, both of you, for, uh, for your time. Awesome. Thank you, Thank you very much, Jake.